<laughs> there we go, here's our surprise and absolutely worth waiting for, even if it means waiting in the rain, don't you think Dave? Now, it is raining quite hard, so every now and again Dave might have to wipe the camera lens, but there we go, young tumba and a guinea fowl. I don't know if those guinea fowl that came flying across to us perhaps heard one of their own meeting a sticky end and decided to respond in kind. Remember those guinea fowl that we saw at the dam earlier? They're quite far from here, but it is possible. And now look, remember how we've spoken about crime scenes and the feathers being plucked away from the... without the points being broken? Watch the way the tumba goes about this process, pulling the feathers away only really breaking them in certain areas where he can't quite get a good grip. I'm just going to add a little bit of light there for Dave. Here we go. This is so, so stunning. There you go, Dave. Your first sighting of Tumba. I nearly called you Tumba. Young Tumba. So for our new viewers, this is Tumba. His mother is Tundi who is the daughter, if you're all keeping track with a pen and pencil, of the wonderful Queen Karula. So he is Karula's grandson. And if we hadn't already had guinea fowl, would this have counted, Kirst, as a guinea fowl as well? It's a sighting. <laughs> Luckily we did have them already, so we don't need to quibble too much on the specifics of that. He has grown quite a bit since I last saw him. And Tumba does have the biggest ears of any leopard cub I ever did see. Although Tristan tells me that all of Tundi's male cubs have had massive ears and massive paws. A thing that I find terribly endearing. Now, I'm not sure. I heard that it was Tundi that killed a guinea fowl. I'm not sure if she gave it up to Tumba or if he was actually the one that caught it and there was a bit of confusion on the radio. There's more than, it's more than within his abilities. Look how he's plucked it almost completely. It looks almost like a plucked chicken. Painstaking business, but obviously Tumba considers it worth it. Especially, I suppose, if he'd made this kill himself, he might be even more particular about plucking away at the feathers. Even though his mum has a full adult waterbuck not far away from where we are now. Uh, at his age, between sort of around about six or so months, we start to see leopard cubs making their first small kills. And of course, every successful kill is a lesson learnt and a lesson in confidence and every failure is also a lesson in its own way. Dave, I think we should go forward. I think we should scoot forward quickly. Apparently all of you are asking about where the water buck is. I actually don't know. I've just spoken to Andrew. He thinks it's a little bit further to the east of where we are now. The reason I'm settling with this not settling, that is completely the wrong way of phrasing it. The reason that we are enjoying Tumba and not Tundi and Tundi's waterbuck is because, there we go, that will help, is because it's now, apparently I've heard a report that Tundi has almost completely disappeared into the long grass. Now what that means is that I would have to go blundering about in the dark, in the long grass, to try and find wherever she is, and Tundi in particular, obviously we never ever want to invade the personal space of any of our leopards, but Tundi just by nature has a slightly larger personal space than the other leopards. And she gets very, very upset if you do that. So I don't want to go blundering about in the dark in a way that causes her a disturbance. Now I'm just going to have to turn this light off because otherwise I'm going to blind the oncoming vehicle. So I'll keep it with a spotlight only. Ah, 
Uh, I think I'm getting this right. Gremlins General. You want to know if Tumba is the same cub that escaped from the baboons in that incredible sighting that we had? And the answer is yes, he is. And that's one of the reasons why I do have such a soft spot for young Tumba. So for new viewers who've missed that particular sighting, and I'm going to have to do some repositioning here, Dave, if you don't mind. Let me just... Are you guys okay there? You fine. Okay, perfect. Now, for those of you that missed it, there was a sighting where Tumba was just, I think, about two and a half months or three months old. And Tundi was sitting with an impala kill. We weren't even sure if the cubs were there. We had a suspicion that they were, but they, we didn't actually know. And all of a sudden, Tundi got up and raced off. And it turned out that there was a troop of baboons. Now, a baboon will kill a, le a leopard cub. Not just kill a leopard cub, they'll play with it before they kill it. Um, which is something that I have seen once before and read about on other occasions, and it's horrible. And Tandy managed to save the life of both of her cubs by distracting the baboons. Unfortunately, this cub's sibling didn't make it. It was killed by lions a couple of weeks after that sighting. But Tumba did escape, he did survive, and he's well on his way to reaching that all-important 12-month-old mark where the chances of survival just get that little bit better. He is gorgeous, isn't he? He really is. He's a special-looking leopard. Those enormous ears. Now, Cora, you want to know why the leopard isn't scared of the spotlight. Well, Cora, the reason that the leopard isn't scared of the spotlight is because it's something that he's become accustomed to. Now, he hasn't been exposed to this since he was little, because that's one thing that we're very careful about, is spotlighting leopard cubs be beneath a certain age or below a certain age. However, you'll actually find that leopards who are spotlighted, skittish leopards, are more comfortable at night with a spotlight on him or on them than they are during the day with just a vehicle driving around. Because they know that it's night time, they just feel that much more secure in themselves. So even the most skittish of leopards, and Tumba is not a skittish leopard, his mother gave birth to him underneath the lodge. Now the reason that it doesn't affect him in any way is because of the reflective layers and the different types of cells in the, the back of his eyes, so in his retina, and that essentially bounces the light back. So it doesn't dazzle him in the same way it would you or I. However, just in terms of sheer respect, um, I try and make sure that my spotlight is down on the ground next to his face. There's my spotlight over there. I try and, personally, it's a personal preference, I try and keep my spotlight down out of the direct face of the animal. It doesn't seem to bother them, but it's just a preference that I have. I feel like it's only polite. Oh, you've got your cheer, boy. He's also got beautiful bottle green eyes. You might also be asking yourself, well, why are we spotlighting him with this kill? Typically when a leopard has a kill on the ground, we don't spotlight them. However, guinea fowl is okay. A guinea fowl is unlikely to attract any major attention. But the water buck, on the other hand, which is another reason why, for now, all of the rest of the guides are avoiding it as well, because they don't have infrared like we do. The water buck is out of bounds, unless you have infrared in the way that we do. But I've already explained how difficult it will be to get into that sighting. Somebody's not particularly hungry. Someone's obviously been eating water buck all day. Because you've got a very full belly, and you're not exactly tucking into that guinea fowl with any great enthusiasm. There's been a lot of procrastinating happening, little man. I think that's the end of us, Dave, for our bird competition, but that's okay. I wonder if Taylor has any intentions of continuing. Obviously, Jamie, because I want to beat you. <laughs>